for us and may I welcome I add my welcome to John's uh, really good to see you all and uh, we'll look at uh, Matthew chapter 4 uh, this week and next week together as uh, the final part of our series on Matthew's gospel 1 to 4 Jesus the Christ uh, God with us uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the so-called problem of evil uh, it has long been called the Achilles heel of the Christian faith, uh, put forward by philosophers like John Stuart Mill. Uh, it is often put like this. God is all-powerful. God is all-good. Uh, yet, evidently, evil exists in the world. Uh, and some might say evil exists abundantly in the world. Since Christianity claims that God is all-powerful, all-good, all-wise, yet evil exists. So... God does not exist. Gotcha. You haven't thought about that, you ignorant Christians. Now, one of the um, students at uni that I um, meet up with often used to ask this question to me uh, many times. Uh, have you ever been asked this question to you about your faith? And I wonder also what your reaction to evil is. But far from being ignorant, the Bible is acutely aware of the problem of evil in our world. The Bible says human beings are not naturally good people who want to do good. In fact, the problem of evil in the world does not really start out there, but it starts here, within human beings. A few chapters later, Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, Out of heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Uh, It is the evil thoughts and sinful hearts from within that ultimately fills the world to be a place with terrible consequences of evil. Selfishness, jealousy, envy, violence, pain, death. Uh, The Bible says that this is not what human beings were meant to be. And this is not what the world was meant to be. But it is now. The world is groaning with pain, Paul says in Romans 8. The world is filled with evil because it lies at the hand of the evil one. Jesus says that Satan, the evil one, is the prince and ruler of this world. This is world under the power of the evil one. It's a world of sin and death. As Matthew says in Matthew chapter 4.16, we now dwell in darkness. Uh, For this reason, uh, according to the Bible, the problem of evil is not a mere philosophical issue to analyze and, you know, have a good debate about. It is a real, deep, sad, and terrifying problem facing humanity, facing you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, when I look at the evil thoughts in my heart, in my own time, it terrifies me. When I look at the world filled with evil and consequences of evil, hurting, destroying, devouring one another, and ultimately suffer the consequences of our evil, it crushes my heart with sadness. Evil saddens, terrifies, and frightens. And I think it's meant to. The sheer weight, power, and consequences of evil in this world is meant to frighten and humble us. When we look at the terrifying reality of evil in our own lives and our world, uh, we are not meant to react in ignorance. Oh, well, there are good things in life and bad things in life. That's just life. That's how a lot of people respond to evil or react to evil and deal with evil. Or... uh, Uh, deny evil, like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris. Universe, at the end of the day, is random. There is no such thing as evil. Just get over it. Bad luck. Evil is too real, too bad, too sad, too terrifying to respond in denial or ignorance or simply as, oh, philosophical problem. Far from being ignorant or unaware of the problem of evil, the Bible actually wants us to feel the full force of evil and recognize that the real problem 
real problem with the problem of evil is that we cannot rescue ourselves from evil and the power of the evil one. Death and the one who holds the power of death, as Hebrews chapter 2.14 calls it, is too strong for you and I. None of us can overcome death, nor the fear of death, which drives a lot of people to live the way they live. The serpent and his lies are too clever and tempting for me to not act with evil thoughts in my heart. Uh, If the problem of evil will ever be solved, if the problem of death will ever be overcome, I need and you need, we need someone and something much greater than ourselves to defeat the power of the evil one. Someone who could actually lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, this is where uh, I want us to pick up our passage again from Matthew chapter 4. One. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. Uh, he was a third moment in human history when a man, a son of God, was tested by the evil one. The two other times, humanity faced the challenge of evil one and their evil proved too, far too smart, far too strong for them. Uh, the first time humanity faced evil was when Adam and Eve was tested by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. At that time, Adam, the first son of God, as Luke calls him in Luke's Gospel, failed to trust in the power, goodness, and wisdom of God. Adam believed the evil's lies, that actually he should become like God himself, seize the power and have the right to determine what is good and evil according to his own eyes, without relying on God, who is good and who created all things good. The devil and his power overcame Adam, and evil entered the world. The Apostle Paul puts these tragic consequences of this day's event in Romans 5.12 in this way. Sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, and death spread to all men because all sinned. Ever since then, we dwelt in a world with the problem of evil. The second time man was tested by the devil was when the people of Israel was on their way to God's promised land. After God had rescued them from the power of an evil ruler, Pharaoh, who said, I do not know the Lord. Uh, There was a great expectation. Perhaps these people who have experienced God's signs and wonders, you you know, they walked through the Red Sea. Uh, Perhaps these people who experienced God's goodness, God, God rescued them from the slavery of the evil one and said of them, Israel is my firstborn son. I have not forgotten you. I know your pain. I will take you to the good land. You will be kingdom of priests and holy priesthood for my name's sake. Perhaps these people would trust God. Perhaps through these people, God will deal with the problem of evil and bring blessing into the whole world through kingdom of priests and royal priesthood. However, The people of Israel, whom God rescued, loved, and called to himself as his firstborn son, also failed miserably. They failed to trust God. They failed to overcome evil. So the two sons of God in the Old Testament, Adam and Israel, were led into temptation and could not deliver us from the power of the evil one. So what will happen this time? With this son of God. Remember chapter 3 verse 17. One verse earlier uh, than the passage today. God speaks of Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What will happen with this son of God as he is confronted by the evil one? Will he trust God and submit himself to the will of God and overcome evil? Will this son of God finally fulfill what every single son of God in human human history has failed before. The spirit anointed Jesus was led into wilderness to be tempted by the devil. If he was to fulfill all righteousness, he must be tested. If he was to be the true son of God, he must overcome the evil one on behalf of the people who are dwelling under the shadow of death. 
Uh, before Jesus' encounter with the devil begins in verse 3, uh, Matthew tells us of uh, some details in verse 2. Look at that. Uh, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was very hungry. Jesus was alone in the wilderness. He had eaten nothing for 40 days. Not even locusts or honey like John the Baptist. Uh, he was at his weakest this point. Even before any testing from the devil began, Jesus was weak, alone, hungry. His situation is far worse than the previous sons of God. It doesn't look very promising at this point. One preacher puts the difference between Adam's testing and Jesus' testing in this way. Adam and Eve were in paradise. Jesus was in the vast, desolate wilderness of Judah, Adam and Eve were physically content and satisfied with all the fruits from God's good, good land. Jesus was hungry, having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Adam and Eve were together. They had each other for company and mutual support. Jesus was all alone. At this point, the tempter came. Look at verse 3. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Uh, I, th- I think the if there in verse 3 is perhaps better translated since. It's not really doubting whether Jesus is the Son of God, but devil is trying to test Jesus. Well, well since you are, do something about it. Uh, in other words, the devil is testing Jesus. Since you are the Son of God, with all authority and power, use your miraculous power to satisfy your hunger. Isn't it beneath your dignity and stature to be hungry and weak like this? What was God thinking? Not even providing for your need? After all, this is not too much. Too much to ask God to provide for your food. Perhaps you cannot trust God to supply and provide for your need. Don't wait for God. Do it yourself. And now, we know the story already, so it's easy to get ahead. But stop and think for a moment. That's a reasonable explanation, isn't it? That doesn't sound too much like a devil to me. I would think the same. It actually sounds rational to me. Doesn't the Son of God have a power to turn the stones into the loaves of bread? Yes, he does. Doesn't the Son of God, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, have the right to satisfy his hunger when he's hungry for 40 days? Why should Jesus be hungry without something as basic as food? If I was in Jesus' situation, with Jesus' power, I would agree with Satan's words at heartbeat, wouldn't you? Jesus has the power. He has the right. And yet, being son of God means he will not use his power for self-gratification. He will not use his authority at odds with God's plan. In the end, it is the Spirit of God that led him to wilderness to be tested, and Jesus will submit himself to God. If God wants me to be tested, I will submit at your will. Not according to my will, but your will be done. Uh, Unlike Adam, who used his authority and privilege of Son of God to claim equality with God, I want to become like God. And unlike each and every one of us who often seek to determine what is right and what is evil, In our own eyes, Jesus will not live by his own sight and his own knowledge, but live by faith in every single moment of his life, in every aspect of his life, even with regards to something as basic, as necessary as food. Withstanding devil's testing, Jesus replies in verse 4. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Uh, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy that Angelina read for us. Uh, There, the people of Israel learned that their hunger in the wilderness was part of God's purpose, uh, part of God's brilliant wisdom and goodness to teach them they are to trust God and that God is trustworthy. And it was only after they had experienced hunger they had experienced, uh, they have uh, learned to humble themselves, that, that, that they cannot live Without God, then God provided food for them so that they will learn to know who God is. God provided for them 
but in his own timing, not at their own convenience, not according to their own will, not according to their own way of seeing what is right and what is wrong. Unlike Israel, who grumbled and failed the test at the time, Jesus will trust God. Jesus will trust God that he is absolutely powerful, absolutely good, absolutely wise. Even if that means he fasts for 40 days. Even if that means, as we'll see later in Matthew's Gospel, that he suffer many things and be killed at the hands of sinners. How different he is to other sons of God. The testing did not end there. Devil this time takes Jesus to a new location with another test. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. The uh, devil's reason for taking Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple becomes plain. Uh, as he says to Jesus in verse 6. Well, since you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Uh, the devil seems to have learned that Jesus trusts God's word and he will obey God's word, the Old Testament. So this time... Uh, he brings a new trick into play. He quotes from an Old Testament. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Uh, he quotes from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, uh, where God promises that he will protect his Messiah. He, he will protect his king, son of David. They will said, look, you are the son of God. Since you are the son of God, throw yourself down and prove yourself. After all, we are at the pinnacle of the temple. You see how many people there are, and they look at your miraculous sign, and that you are the chosen one. They worship you. Come on, prove it. You have God's promise. However, the devil was twisting the real intention of God's promise in Psalm 91. The uh, devil was, in fact, here actually encouraging Jesus to deliberately create a situation so that God would be obliged to fulfill his promise to Jesus. So that God is there to serve the purpose of the Son of God, rather than the Son of God serving the purpose of God. And we do this time, don't we? Uh, time to time. And we say, you know, well, God, you promised that you will protect me. I'm in a tough situation now, so deliver me from this situation, and then I really, from now on, really worship you. I really praise you. I, 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 for, if you really help me this time, I will do this for you. Now, that kind of a bargaining with God, trying to force God's hand to do what I want him to do, with even using Bible verses. Okay? Look very pious when you use Bible verses like that. Uh, that is Satan's tactics. If there are any of us who approach God in this way, who offers God, you know, you're almost like offering God a trade. You give me this, and then I'll worship you. If you don't give me this, I don't know if I can fully trust you. Recognize that. Uh, that is not true worship. That is actually idol worship. That's what idols do for you. Trade in. And that's actually what Satan will offer. Uh, Satan, uh, worshiping Satan, it can work like that. Satan, uh, you give me this, and I'll give you mine. But God will not be mocked. Uh, do you also notice that in today's passage, Satan is not dumb? You know, he tempts and tests Jesus with what might have been most tempting for Jesus. And we'll see that throughout Matthew's Gospel as well. Uh, he does not test Jesus with, if, we, if I may put it that way, like silly, murder, committing adultery. But with what's rational and logical and reason, like provide food for yourself, like uh, reading from the Bible. He says, look, the Bible says there are good things in life that you should enjoy. You know, if God wouldn't do this for you, if God doesn't even satisfy and provide for your basic needs, does he really love you? Is he really good? Can you really trust him? And how many of us have fallen into that lie of Satan? How many of us try to force God's hand and get him to serve our own purposes rather than submitting ourselves to his purpose trusting that in his own time he will answer our prayers uh, trusting that God knows better than us and at the right time God will answer us instead of that how many of us doubt, complain grumble about our situations when our living standards does not meet our expectations on our own the devil is too strong 
too deceitful for us to overcome. If we were to not be led into temptation, if we were to be delivered from the power of the evil one, we need someone who would love God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength. Uh, We need someone who, with all of his being, desire to see God's name being hallowed. His will be done, not ours, even at the cost of his own convenience his own glory, and even his own life. And look at verse 7. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. At last, here is a man, a son of God who holds fast to God, even in the face of the deceitful power of the evil one. However, the devil hadn't given up. Verse 8, again, the devil took him, this time to a very high mountain. And what does he do? Shows him all the kingdoms, their glory. The devil takes Jesus to a position even further up than the pinnacle of the city. Uh, From this high mountain, the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. Uh, The word word glory here, uh, I think, refers to the outward appearance of a thing. Uh, the, the, The splendor, attractiveness of this world. You you look at all the Instagram photos of um, uh, the beautiful places around this world, whether it be the attractiveness of the New York City uh, to uh, the the high-rise buildings of Wall Street, things like that. Uh, In the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel had a different view of the kingdoms of this earth. Daniel compared, actually, the kingdoms of this world and their glory like the beasts, you know, Uh, bloodthirsty, bringing oppressive destruction and death. Hence, Daniel prophesied that one day there will be a kingdom of heaven which will uh, crush and overcome the evils of the kingdoms of this earth and establish God's rule and his glory forever. However, here, the devil only shows Jesus the outward appearance, the attractiveness, uh, the splendor, and majesty of kingdoms of this world to lure him in. Look, verse 9, he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You see what I mean? With the devil, it works like that. If you, if you fall, fall down and worship devil, he will give you what you want. And this is how so many humans in the past and present have seen the kingdoms of this world and desired its glory. Uh, This is how, actually, devil rules the world today. Devil does not rule by um, um, kind of uh, uh, taking over your spirit. Devil rules uh, by the lies of this world, getting you to trust him instead of trusting God and living by his rule. This is how the, the gospel of status, the gospel of wealth, the gospel of security, the gospel of a fun life, Taking off all the bucket list, the gospel of well-being, healthy lifestyle. Isn't that right? And Satan will give it to you if you trust him, if you bow down and worship him. And how many people have decided to follow him instead of trusting God? Jesus replies in verse 10, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Uh, To be sure, actually, once again, all these kingdoms properly belong to Jesus. He is the Son of God. God promised in the Old Testament, Psalm 2, God will give him the kingdoms of the earth. It would have been right, once again. You know, Satan's temptation for Jesus is not unreasonable. However, Jesus refuses to take it from Satan. And he refuses to take it at Satan's timing. Rather, Jesus will submit to God, God's plan. And one day he will receive all authority in heaven and on earth from God himself. With this, verse 11, the devil left him. Behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Uh, He finally is a son of God, son of David, son of Abraham, a new Israel who overcomes the power of the evil one. First time in human history, a man firm in the face of evil temptation. 
For the first time in human history, the terrifying and frightening power of the evil one is made to naught in the obedience of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in whom God is well placed. As Matthew's gospel unfolds, the devil will come back again and again to test Jesus to not trust God, but take the matters into his own hand. Uh, you know, take the power to himself with his miraculous authority. But again and again, Jesus will submit himself to God's will. He will not bow down to Satan's temptation, but he will live in accordance with God's purpose that he must suffer many things and be killed and on the third day rise again. Uh, When tempted by his friend Peter to not suffer but to take the matters into his own hands, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 22, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. Again, when he was tempted to defend himself by force in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus will say, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus knew he could. Yet, he says, how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Even on the cross, Jesus was tested as people mocked at him, saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He says he's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross. Then we will believe you. We will worship you. If you come down from the cross, he trusts God. Let God deliver him if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 42, 43. What we see is that Jesus was tested, tempted, and tried in every possible way. He knows what it's like to be hungry. You know, he knows what it's like to be lonely. Uh, uh, And also, when you look at John's gospel, he knows what it's like to lose his best friend to death. What it's like to be betrayed by his closest friends and let down by people you trust and love. He faced uh, enough cases of illnesses in his own life and the terrifying reality of evil. Far from being ignorant of the problem of evil, the Son of God entered in to the name means back in chapter 1. You shall name his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from the consequences of their evil things. He did this for you and I because we cannot rescue ourselves from evil. We cannot rescue ourselves from the consequences of evil in this world. The Son of God entered in our place, tested and tried in every possible way, and trusted, obeyed God perfectly for you and for me. In him, a light finally dawns for people dwelling in darkness. This is what happens When God is with us, Emmanuel, the evil one begins to lose its power because God is with us. Who says Christian God is far away if God is with us? When we get to the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus will demonstrate his ultimate victory over evil. After dying for our sins on the cross, he rises on the third day and declares, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. The evil one no longer rules the world. He is no longer prince of the world. He has been defeated decisively, even though he is still at act, prowling around, trying to devour someone who doesn't trust Jesus. And the one who died for us, the one who defeated the evil decisively at the cross and in his resurrection, will come back to deal with every single evil deeds and evil things and consequences of evil completely and finally and once and for all. He will come back. And as we wait his return in this world where evil is not yet completely destroyed, and even that, we must remember that is according to God's good, wise, and powerful purpose. We must trust God 
Yeah, we do not have all the final answers to the problem of evil, but we can trust God, can't we? And what he offers is that he promises to be with us till the end of the age. So evil is still powerful, still scary, but we no longer fear like we used to. Though we walk in the valley of death, we can trust in him that he will protect us. The problem of evil is real, it's bad, it's frightening, and it's sad. But it is no longer an impossible problem because God has done something about it. In Jesus, God has defeated evil decisively for you and I. So even in the face of such terrifying reality of evil in this world, we walk by faith in the risen Son of God. And we pray with hope and confidence with these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, both now and forever. Amen.